something that people tend to do, which is uh, sometimes an effective social strategy, sometimes it's sort of like transparent and obnoxious, is name drop, right? That they'll sort of casually let slip in a conversation that maybe they know someone famous or important or that they might have, you know, been hanging out with some people who are real movers and shakers. And, you know, again, it works sometimes and like people get some opportunities that way. And other times people are like, why, why are you doing that? That's like so tacky. Um, but I do think that that concept of name dropping gets at a really important idea in how networks of people are connected, right? And that's related to a bunch of your research. So I guess I'm curious, you know, what are people getting at when they're, when they're name dropping, when they're saying, oh, I know this person who like happens to be famous, even though maybe I'm not as famous as them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's like this old adage of it's not what you know, it's who you know. And, and to some extent, name dropping helps us orient somebody in, in our social sphere. So we know who are their, their connections. And, and especially if there are people that we know that that helps us um, have some understanding of, uh, of who might trust this person, who might be able to vouch for this person and so forth. But more generally, you know, when you're thinking about, say, you know, getting information about a product out, like if you're trying to do viral marketing or something, it's not necessarily just how many connections a person has but it's whether that person's well connected themselves and and that kind of iterative idea of influence and centrality is something that that comes up in so many different spheres when you start looking at networks it, it's ubiquitous and and it, it really you know it helps you understand why it is that people who are well connected in terms of having well connected friends are the people who ultimately can really make change and and influence a society yeah, totally. And you, and you can kind of see that um, on certain social networks, right? Like a network like Twitter actually makes that pretty legible, where you can see followers who you know who follow someone, yeah. right? And, and, and I think people maybe have that experience of coming across an account that doesn't have a ton of followers, but then you look at the people who follow them and it's like, you know, multiple startup founders or like famous stand-up comedians or whatever. And you're like, oh, this person only has 3,000 followers, but like they're followed by 25 people who each have a combined... 10 million followers. Yeah, right exactly. And then when you start looking at the retweets of their tweets, that can be that that can spread things much further than just the direct tweets, right? And and just counting followers misses that that aspect of it. And you know, especially if you want to reach into different communities too, then having the ability to have connections of people that reach outwards is really important whereas, you know, just having your direct connections might just be you know, hitting people that are very similar to yourself and so forth. And, and the more it's both diversity of connections, reach of those connections. And yeah, um, you know, Twitter is a good example. Um, there's lots of examples where, where, you know, knowing the right key people is the gateway to, to information and opportunities. Yeah, for sure. It, it's, um, it, it's very interesting because the, the idea of like, oh, we just need to get the word out about this new album that we're trying to release or this new product that we want to launch or whatever, that it's not just about having a lot of people hear a message, right? That you can buy eyeballs or you can like create some sort of press uh, push that you're sort of like slipping money into people's hands. A lot of people see something, but that doesn't always necessarily result in that thing being taken up. Whereas potentially being, uh, you know, plugged into these networks where people do have these important people who they're plugged into, that that seems to be something that's potentially more effective. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and you know, we've done some, I've did, uh, been involved in a long-term research project in Southern India, where we were working with a set of organizations that were trying to spread information about microfinance. This was work with um, two recent Nobel Prize winners, actually, uh, Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo, and then also Arun Chandra Sikar. And we were trying to figure out, help these, these were banks going in, trying to give out loans that were very attractive to people and would help them in, in poor regions where they didn't have access. And, and they were following this kind of policy of let's just find the best connected people in terms of the most connections, right? So they would look for in the village, look for people that were really well connected in terms of having lots of connections. But in, in some villages that was working really well, they were getting good spread. Other villages, it wasn't, it, you know, these people weren't getting the participation that that the bank needed to, to really make these kinds of um, programs work. And when we went in and we, we went in and we, you know, carefully mapped out the networks, that's sort of a whole nother story, but you know, you go in and you really want to find the information about who knows who and, and track all this. And we found that the 
best predictor of who was really good at spreading information um, was was somewhat uncoupled from how many people they knew, but really depended on um, not just their friends, how well those people were connected, but we, it would go out a distance of about three. So it was three or four, you know, you could, you could look at what their reach was, what was their footprint in the network in terms of who could they contact and then who could those people contact and so forth. And that was the real predictor of, of whether information spread well or not. And, you know, once you, once you saw that, then you could go in and, and you know, we tried, you know, doing this and other kinds of experiments and, and targeting people in this way increased the, the spread of information pretty dramatically. Um, so it really has a big impact. Yeah, I got it. So a few questions just about the the microfinance structure here. So I think this is something that maybe people have some intuition about that, okay, there's this idea of giving small loans to, you know, people in villages in India in this case, where they may not have access to traditional credit. And then the idea there is that they can potentially start businesses or what, like, what's the, what's the, um, um, I guess, like the outcome that these people are, are hoping to get? Yeah. I mean, you know, originally the, the, the point of this was exactly as you're saying, you, you're trying to give loans. These are unsecured loans so that, you know, people don't have a lot of collateral. These are very poor people. They're living on a couple of dollars a day. Um, they're pretty high risk loans. It's not like you can guarantee that these people are going to have the money to pay you back if they have a crop failure or something. And so, um, you know, basically the banks had to try and figure out what, what's a way to do this. And um, the, the, these are called Grameen style banks now, the, the, uh, or loans. The, the first version of this came out of a, a bank in, in Bangladesh. And eventually the structure of these is sort of you give out loans to people. And you give them out in groups of five people. And <clears throat> then if anybody in that group doesn't repay, the whole group is responsible. And, and so the idea was you sort of use social capital instead of financial capital as the, as the collateral, yeah. right? And so yeah, you if get, you show up late, the whole team's running sprints. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And exactly. And, and, and that's a very effective um, way to... And, and so basically in these villages, you know, the interest rates on these loans are not low because this is, you know, a, a little higher than credit card risk. And so, you know, you're looking at like 30 to 40% interest rates, and yet you get like 99 to 100% repayment once you use this kind of social structure. And so it's very, very effective loans. And, and so, you know, these have been spreading quite dramatically around the world um, in lesser developed countries, especially when, you know, people have almost no savings and don't have access to credit cards or other kinds of means of storing value. And so, um, you know, they've been incredibly popular, but getting them out in the hands of the people who need them isn't so, so easy. Um, yeah, got it. So just, just another question then, are, are these primarily being used for agricultural purposes that people are investing in, you know, machinery or crops or something like that? Or what are they actually using them for? Yeah. So, you know, I think the, it, it, there's been a bit of a, of a mystery as to whether the the these loans have a big impact on the economies and and I think what you when you actually look very closely what you see is the following so the hope was okay these are going to be loans that allow people to say maybe make an investment maybe I could buy a tractor or I, I could buy a truck or I could um, buy a refrigerator or something that's going to help my business in in these small villages but instead a lot of it seems to be used for consumption smoothing purposes what do I mean by that you know. Um, normally, if, if you're in one of these villages, you might ha take almost all the wealth you've got and invest it, say, in the seeds and the stuff that goes into your planting. And then it might be six months that you're basically starving. And then suddenly you sell it all and you get this windfall. And, and during that time period, you have no way of, of you know, getting money in. And other people in your village are in the same boat. And so it's, you can borrow a little bit, but it's very difficult. And so part of what seems to happen is they'll use this these loans just to smooth that time period, you know, the, their income over these time periods, and then repay a lot of it um, when they have the chance. You know, so they store some of the money that they get from the loans. They repay some of the um, uh, some over time, but it allows them to smooth their their consumption, whereas otherwise they'd be sort of feast and famine, um, literally. And and this is just a, a really nice way of of allowing them. You know, a lot of us do that with credit cards and other kinds of things. Like if you, you, know, you, you have higher consumption one month or something, you might float it for, for a month or two and, 
and we have access to ways that allow us to do that or mortgages and things like that that allow us to spread payments out. And these people don't have that. And, and so it's a way of allowing them to do that. And so it, that kind of stuff doesn't show up when you look at a, a village, then two years later, you say, oh, it doesn't look that much more productive. But what you, if you look at inside the village and you just look at day to day, are the kids um, eating? Um, they're eating more regularly on a day to day basis than they would be in a village that didn't have these loans. So even though it doesn't show up in like machinery and productivity and so forth, it shows up in healthier kids and, and you know, just um, happier people. Yeah. So it's not so much like capital investment, like, okay, we need a new thresher or whatever. It's like, okay, we have these windfalls throughout the year and we have these periods potentially of, like you said, literal famine. And like you mentioned, the, potentially the whole village is in a state of famine. So it's not like, oh, well, we just need to kind of like make it through the next month or whatever. It's like the whole village needs to make it through the next month. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Steps yeah, and, in there. Exactly. And, and, and I think that, you know, that ultimately, eventually, once the village starts growing and, and gets its, you know, the, its feet on the ground and, and gets to a higher income level, then you start seeing more investments and you might see people starting a business or making some kind of capital investments and so forth. But, but that sort of comes at a higher income level. And a lot of these loans are coming at you know at pretty much right at the poverty level where people are are barely making it, and for them it it's a big help, but it's not one that shows up in a lot of um, in, in in terms of the economic outcomes directly. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so it, like you said, that if if someone does want to mention only whatever productivity numbers or something, that they might see that in the future where it's like okay, these people are actually able to be healthy enough for long enough that they can then get to the stage where maybe they do want to take out a different kind of loan to buy a thresher or what have you. Yeah, exactly. Is that exactly. accurate? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And, and, and often, you know, the, one of the nice things about microfinance is that you see people grow their loans. And so that over time, if they've made, you know, a loan for, say, the base amount is about 10,000 rupees, which is roughly, say, $200, a little less than $200 now. It was $200 at the time of the study. Um, then the next year they might take out two loans or a bigger loan. And then after that, once they've gotten financially used to dealing with this and they start to see the possibilities, then you start seeing several of them getting together and then maybe investing. You know, So in one village I went in, there were um, three women that were together investing in a truck that then one of the women's brothers was using to take some of the goods that they had and drive it further to a market where they could get more money for the stuff that they were producing. And so, you know, they saw that as a reasonable investment. They bought like a used truck. And, and so that's something that they wouldn't have been able to do without, but it took them a few years to sort of, of being in these programs to see how it worked and get, get their, you know, their feet on the ground and then slowly um, see that possibility. Got it. No, that makes a lot of sense. And then, yeah, not to get too in the weeds, just in the dynamics of the loans. Yeah. But one other thing that really struck me reading about them is that they only loan to women. Is that correct? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And uh, you know, part of the idea there is, uh, yeah, especially in, in some of the countries where these loans are are given most frequently, um, there's uh, a disparity in in bargaining within a household and power. You know, it's these are male dominated societies. And most all the income comes in through the mail, and the males decide what to do. And so having the money actually come in through the female doesn't necessarily mean that, that she ends up controlling it, but it does mean that she becomes a more important source of income mm. into the household. And that seems to improve the, the bargaining position. It, it seems to improve especially the investment in things like children. So there's been a bunch of studies in looking at if the money comes into the household through a woman, does it affect how much investment is made in sons versus daughters and things like that. And you see some gains for the daughters in terms of how much, you know, how well they're taken care of and whether or not they get to go to school and things like that. So, so the idea was sort of, you know, female empowerment in these households, and it does seem to have that effect. Definitely. Got it. So, so yeah. So is that then a decision made by the lending company for like social good? Like, okay, we want to, you know, promote female empowerment, or is it some sort of actuarial actuarial calculation of like, oh, it's more likely to be paid back yeah. if we lend to a female, I, or some combination of both? I think it's both, actually. I, um, okay. I haven't seen these actuarial numbers, so I don't know um, personally. But I, I, my impression is that the males are less uh, dependable in terms of of repayments as well, 
and and so you you you're both empowering the females and and you might be getting a higher repayment rate as well um okay yeah yeah that 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 was interesting because that just kind of struck me where I was like that's a, that's a pretty interesting way to um to lend and and actually another question on that i mean my half baked understanding of different indian cultures that there's very regional dependent amounts of um let's just call it like female empowerment where some you know cities and states or whatever have totally different cultures with like how uh patriarchal they are let's say is that is that your understanding are these all like within the same clusters of like certain regions or is this kind of like a broad program uh well it's you know india is probably the most complex social environment i've ever encountered it's you know and, and i'm by no means an expert so but but you know visiting there you're just struck by how diverse it is across different regions the the regions have their own history they have their own you know different religious groups different um caste structures so the caste structure is not uniform across the the country by any means and the same castes in different areas have different meanings and different interpretations and sometimes interact across caste lines sometimes don't that depends on the region um there's a rough rule of thumb that that urban areas are becoming more liberal at at a faster rate than rural areas and you know um and that that's partly because of uh some female participation in labor force and other kinds of things that that's slowly happening there and um you're seeing more women become educated so but but it it's hard to it's to pinpoint specific regions that are much more liberal than others but it it, it it's a mishmash and um certainly in these poor more um rural areas you tend to see more traditional and historic and caste based um uh culture politics economics um you know there's still the, the woman you, know, you have several generations of women living in the same household and the um daughter-in-law is is sort of the lowest on a totem pole and and basically answers to the to the her husband's mother the mother-in-law and and you know there there's um a very interesting structure there and um uh, and and one that's pretty difficult to change so it's it's been something that the um various organizations including at times the indian government has been attempting to to push and nudge away from that got it cool yeah so so i just wanted to like actually understand what's going on with these loans right because it's like okay this is a pretty interesting program and just figuring out like what are the what is the outcome that these loans are giving people like why would they want them why would they even potentially recommend them to someone? Um, so yeah, in terms of zooming back out then to, okay, trying to get people to potentially take up a loan like this. I know you mentioned before that the the companies were coming in and they're just saying, okay, who are the most well-connected people in this village? We need to tell them about the loans. And then you retroactively found that that was actually not the best strategy, correct? Yeah, exactly. So so the idea is they're, they're, they went in and, and the, they had sort of a rule of thumb that they just told the employees, look for shopkeepers, look for teachers, look for self-help group leaders. These are people who interact with lots of other people. They should be good at spreading news. And in some cases, they were really well connected in terms of, of, of interacting with lots of other people. But it turns out that that wasn't the key to getting the information out. It was whether or not they were connected to other people who were then connected to other people and actually spread the news outward. So it's sort of like, you know, it, it, it's hard. <laughs> Networks are very visual and you sort of want to, you know, think of yourself, think of some kind of web growing outwards, right? It's like a, a tree and and it, something can grow very rapidly if, if it's sort of like each person has, right? It's this idea of, you know, I have two friends and they have two friends and they have two friends. That's much better than than just one person having lots of friends. Um, that expands much more rapidly. And so the idea is you, you want to find those people who have that nice expansive property and sit at key parts of the network. And that's very different than just somebody who's got lots, you know, it's, it's like, you know, you can have a Taylor Swift that has millions of followers and that's great. You get a quick blast, but that doesn't necessarily resonate and then reach people beyond her followers. 
and um, you know, I, I don't know. Actually, Taylor Swift might have really good connections. So <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, sure yeah, she does, yeah, yeah. right? So <laughs> she probably can tap on people that 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 are really well connected. So she might not be the best example, but um, there could be somebody who just has like you know lots of flowers, and that that's not the person that you want to reach to to reach that second level. Um, yeah, I was having a conversation yesterday actually about like why doesn't Dune have the same level of fandom? as something like Star Wars or Lord of the Rings or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, sort of retroactively, it's like, oh, maybe people who like Dune, maybe that selects for more introverted people who don't tend to have <laughs> as many connections <laughs> yeah. or whatever. Yeah. I mean, totally untested hypothesis. Right, but, right, right, you know, right. Seems seems viable. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a different <laughs> type that it reaches and they don't they don't um rebroadcast or don't socialize about it. Um that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so this idea then of, you know, to, to use like the, the technical term of like eigenvector centrality, meaning that the, the, this person's connections have more connections as well. Um, I'm curious as well, cause you mentioned just like the idea of like bridging the gap between different clusters of people and stuff like that. Do, do, do you see effects where it's like, oh, if this person has high eigenvector centrality and is also potentially the bridge between multiple networks was that even better or is it just kind of like yeah. the eigenvector centrality dominates yeah yeah so this concept of eigenvector centrality i i think of connectedness i mean you can there's lots of different ways to think of it but let's break it into three main pieces one is just you know raw numbers of followers and that's great for just you know getting those followers to to know things the second is this eigenvector that we we're just talking about and then the third is what's known as betweenness centrality. And, and that means exactly as you're referring to, there's different groups and you want these people that are be able to, to bridge those groups. And that can be important because those are people who then can coordinate those groups or they can get information from one to the other. Or in the case of, of these Indian villages, it turns out that you wanted somebody not just with high eigenvector centrality, but also that was connected to multiple caste groups. Because the caste mm. groups within those villages tend to be really insular. So there'll be some castes that just don't talk to any other groups, right? And, and if you don't have somebody in that group that you're talking to, it's really difficult to get information out into them. And so you also want this second level of somebody who bridges across, across groups. And that turns out to be important. Or else you want to make sure that you've got somebody who's well-connected in each of those groups, right? So if you want to spread something virally, you want to look and say, here's a community. This is a pretty insular community. We have to reach somebody inside that community. And we either have to have somebody who's well connected to somebody there or hit that person directly. And, and that kind of structure you know, becomes really evident once you start looking at these networks. And in, in the Indian case, um, but, you know, it's pretty hard to find a society that doesn't have insular communities and isn't split along some lines. And the you know how do you get that message into those groups? You need people that are that are connected across these groups. Um, Got it. So yeah, especially with the caste society where you have these very bright bright social lines, that it is super important to have someone at least bridging between those different groups as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you know, there's so many settings where you it, it's easy to think you're reaching people because you know something is a message is getting out there and getting relayed, but there can be whole groups that have no idea of this. And, and the amazing thing that we found in these villages, which we went back, um, you know, we went back a bunch of times, but say five years later after the original program, and we thought by then everybody should know about the availability. And there were still pockets of the villages who were completely ignorant of its existence. And these are villages of like 215 households, say, right? Uh, you know, so it, it's not the, uh, like a huge thing. You'd think it's like in your high school or something, you know, if you Everybody should know something once at least half the yeah, people do like it. Yeah, it's like Billy's it's, dating Susie. Everyone knows. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. It's it's got to be it's got to be widely known, and 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 there's pockets that just never hear, and and you know you you have to get into those groups in order to to spread the news effectively. Yeah, that that's really interesting that you do end up with these little clusters that just kind of are isolated from everyone else. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, that that that's like you said, surprising and counterintuitive. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm curious about the the decay that you mentioned as well. It seems like um, information seems to spread about three connections out. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that you saw specifically with microfinance? Is that sort of like a more universal rule with a lot of stuff? Like, what's the what's the situation there? Yeah, I think um, it's it, it, it's what we saw with microfinance certainly, and you know, part of just to put a number on it, it's like. It, um, if if you have five friends 
you are likely to tell one of them. And then if they have five friends, you know, and, and so it, it started to decay, it starts dying downwards if you don't have a huge number of friends. And this gets into something that we've heard a lot about in terms of COVID and so forth, which is these kind of reproduction numbers. And whether or not something's going to keep oscillating and keep going um, depends on what that kind of process looks like. And um, with, with microfinance, it had a decay where it was a topic for a while that people were excited about. You know, microfinance is from finally coming to our village. Um, there's going to be loan officers here and we can, we can sign up for this. People were excited about it for a few weeks and, and then it, it tended to die down and then it was no longer the hot topic of conversation. And it, it seemed like it spread a distance three in the network and then it kind of tailored, um, tapered off. But I, that's depends on the topic. And I think, you know, like if you look at Twitter, um, there's basically like an 18 hour typical, you know, things that really go viral. It's about 18 hours sure. and then it's dead. Yeah, like who, who's the it's main like, character of Twitter for today? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And th these things have really short lives, right? And it, But then there's other ones where you can still find tweets about, you know, like Obama's birth certificates are still being you know, slowly retweeted and stuff. So there's certain topics that, that never die down. And then there's other ones that, that have a very short um, half-life. And this, you know, kind of information, I think, vital information, a lot of the news stories and so forth have cycles. And then after that, it, it kind of dies down. And unless people have um, some resurgence of interest in something, it, you know, they sort of move on in, in terms of topics. Uh, and, yeah, and so I, I guess I'm... Yeah, I'm curious about the, the the decay of microfinance then, because to to me, I, I guess I kind of think of stuff like that, like, OK, what what's the size of the latent market for this thing? Like, what's the size of the latent market for this idea? You know, you used a COVID analogy earlier, where I think probably a lot of people have some intuition for this, where it's like, OK, there's large pockets of the population that have either not been infected or not been vaccinated. You know, where are they? And if you manage to connect to those, then all of a sudden you have like spread again of the idea. So to me, it seems like, okay, microfinance is probably something where there's a very large latent market um, in, in these villages, right? That most people would probably be interested in picking it up. And you can see that with certain ideas, right? There's clearly certain conspiratorial ideas or, or ways of framing things where it's like people are predisposed to kind of like maybe have bad ideas yeah. about sticking needles in children. So yeah. Yeah, like yeah, it's yeah. not surprising, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not surprising yeah. that like the the these various concerns about vaccines keep coming up because it's like, yeah, it makes sense. Like people are afraid of spiders, right. you know. They don't right, like right, things right. with eight legs. Cool. <laughs> they don't like putting needles in children. You yeah. know. They don't like the idea of outsiders coming in and telling them what to do. Like, got it. Sort yeah. of understand that. Um, so I guess I'm almost surprised that something like microfinance would tend to decay because I would intuitively guess that there's a large latent market for it, so it should just kind of like keep spreading is 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 my intuition offers or something else going on yeah but i think part of it is is um so you're right that there might be interest on the side of the people wanting to learn about it so there might be a lot of people who are potentially interested the the question is whether or not the people who are doing the broadcasting keep broadcasting right mm. and and some you know even myself i'll find that like once i've told a few things something i might be really excited about a new idea and i'll tell a couple of friends about it but after that, I feel like I've I've talked it out, and and so I don't keep talking like every friend, right? And and it's, it's some somehow it becomes like old news to us. And I think we all have that kind of um, you know basic. This this seems like it's stale. It's it's no longer the hot topic, and so we drop it. And even though there's things that we should be talking about all the time and and keeping up on those things, they they seem less relevant once they've gotten old. It's it's literally like a fashion almost, and. And, and that's unfortunate because, you know, there's things that we need to know and there's other things that are, are more faddish and those ones should fade away. But the, the ones that like, you know, these loans are really valuable to these people. And, and that's something that, that we want to make sure gets to all the people in the village, but it, it dies out before it hits them all. Uh, yeah. So it's not necessarily the, the receivers of the information. It's the providers of the information that are like, Cool. I told everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. need to talk about yeah. it anymore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I'm not going to tweet yeah, again about it. Uh, yeah, totally. Yeah, it's like I'm a broken record. Well, I mean, and it's not like microfinance activates any sort of like identity 
right? Like, I mean, for, for those watching on video, right, I'm wearing a Def Leppard shirt because it's like, I want people to know that I like <laughs> Def Leppard, right? And I'm like, no one's going to wear like a microfinance shirt. Right, right, like. right, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's, yeah. So, and, and that's true. If, if people, uh, you know, I know like, talking to a lot of companies in the Silicon Valley, they're interested in, in getting noticed and so forth. For them, they think of like having an evangelist, right? Somebody who really um, is is some super fan of the concept and really likes it can be more effective than somebody who's just well connected. And so, like all the network concepts capture the connections and who you reach, but you also need somebody who's fervent about things, right? So, um, one thing we found is that the people who actually participated in the microfinance tended to talk about it about 10 times more than the people who decided not to take out the loans, right? And so not surprisingly, they were excited about it and, and they kept telling their friends. And the people who said, oh, I don't want to loan myself, they, never, they were less effective news spreaders by a factor of 10. So um, it, it, it makes a difference what your personal opinion is of something. And if you're excited about it, you can be a more effective spreader because you activate more of your network. And so it's not just how many connections you have, but whether you use them and, and who you're telling and uh, that, that becomes equally important. Yeah. Did, did you see um, super spreaders, not just in terms of the, the connectivity of the network, but people who seem to like convert others at much higher rates? Yeah. You know, in, in these villages, I think it, it's sort of interesting. Um, we didn't see super spreaders as, as much. So there were people who tended to be well connected and told lots of people and and seemed to be key. Um, these the, the I think that this sort of scale that we're looking at of of um, person to person kind of direct conversations are are less conducive to super spreaders than than people who are somehow really really well connected online, um, you know, who can blast things out to lots of people. Um, so, so these villages are, are are a little more egalitarian in terms of their social structures than than online networks. So, if you start looking at, you know, one thing that that we do in network analysis is you sort of look at how equal are people's network sizes, and network sizes on things like Twitter are are a factor of ten to twenty more unequal than the kinds of networks that we have in person. So, if you look inside a high school, you know, there's going to be more popular kids and less popular kids. But it's not as if the more popular kids have fr are friends with everybody in the school, um, whereas on, on Twitter you get you know that that kind of scale difference. And so social media kind of amplify these inequalities that we see socially to to a great extent. I guess the, the, to use the high school analogy that you just used because that, that that brings up an interesting idea where. You, you may even have like popular kids who have the same number of friends as someone who's like a geek, right? They might have like literally the same number of connections, but the popular friends are higher social status compared to the geeks. And I guess I'm curious, like, was there any correlation between any sort of social status and like spreading this idea? And I mean, that would be difficult to quantify, I guess, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, so we, we did, we did some experiments um, after the first set of, of research we did there. We went back in and we were trying to spread information about different things. And we went in and we asked people, you know, who are the respected elders in the village? And, and we tried to get a hold of them. And then we were using them to sort of also spread information about a new cell phone uh, availability. So we were trying to test some of the things we'd learned from the first study and see, fine tune some of these ideas. And it turns out that they were not good spreaders. So, um, and and it was interesting because there, there's sort of two reasons that these people seem to not be good spreaders. Um, generally, you know, there, there are people who are more respected and so forth. So if they did choose to spread the information, then it, it would be very effective in getting other people to follow them. But they seemed reticent to do it. And it might be that they thought this was kind of frivolous, that there are these outsiders coming in trying to, you know, get people involved in cell phone. I don't want to be involved in that. and so. They were less um, use, useful to us than people who were less well connected and less respected um, in, in terms of actually getting their willingness to buy into this and, and help spread. So these kinds of respected elders aren't necessarily always, um, you know, the, the people depends on their willingness to, to actually be involved and whether or not they buy into something. And in this particular case, they didn't. Um, 
but more generally, well, the, yeah, yeah you, you would think of, you know, there's people that you respect and, you know, and, and we're all a little bit of imitators in the sense that, we, you know, if there's somebody who we look up to and, and think of as a, a good role model, that person does something, then we're much more likely to do it. So there's an aspect of that, that that's socially very important, but you also need those per people to actually do what you <laughs> want them to do if you're trying to spread information. No, that totally makes sense that there's like different kinds of things that spread in different ways. I mean, yeah, to, to use the high school example, it's like, okay, you know, when I was in high school, if the right two people got th this certain North Face jacket, like there, yeah. there were going to yeah. be a lot of people with that yeah, North yeah, Face yeah. jacket, right? Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, to use something we were talking about earlier, you know, someone who may have the same number of friends reads Dune, like no one else is going right. to read Dune. They're right, like, I'm right, not right. doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but like, yeah. I'd happily buy this North Face jacket. So right. yeah, it kind of makes sense. Like, yeah, that. yeah, yeah. yeah. Totally. And it might be hard to get the most popular kids to read Dune, right? They, 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 yeah. you know, it's like, oh, I don't, I'm not reading that. <laughs> so, yeah, so. Not, not interesting. <laughs> yeah. oh. Not interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and the, uh, the, the, the weird David Lynch movie, you know, not necessarily uh, <laughs> A super, super yeah, yeah, accessible yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> three hour bizarre film. Either. Yeah. I mean, I think that thing is, is, is critically uh, not acclaimed, but I remember liking it. So yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually I, I just reread Dune uh, a, f a few months ago because I guess there's a new movie coming out. So I was, I hadn't read it in many years. Yeah. I thought, wow, this is a good time to reread this. It's, it's a, yeah, you definitely. know, from a social network person's perspective, it was very interesting to see how he, navigated different groups and activated groups and yeah there's a lot of social network in there yeah did, did it hold up reasonably well yeah you know I, um i'm more of a tolkien fan myself so i'm a sure a, yeah but but um he he writes in ways that are very different in terms of of you know sort of thinking about this whole society's um you know the idea of this religious movement forming after a character and 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 having this long standing uh effect or not long standing but um long lasting and forward moving effect that that was inevitable um you know that kind of sociological perspective is pretty powerful and and thinking about how groups of people can act not as individuals but as whole um groups following a leader um it's it's pretty dangerous and he paints that picture pretty well got it yeah that that's um i i do remember like some of that stuff i read it so long ago that i couldn't even probably provide like a reasonable plot summary but um it is interesting looking back on that stuff where you know the sci-fi novels and fantasy novels that i loved as a kid some of them are completely fantastic and totally hold up as an adult and other ones are just atrocious You're like, yeah, this is, yeah, 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 yeah. like the writing is so bad the characters yeah. are so bad but I, I liked this just as much as i liked lord of the rings why yeah yeah, yeah 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 i mean i think you know the ones that stand up somehow have some aspect to them they're either either they have some psychological truths and interesting you know lines going on or they've got some kind of social things or or the conflicts between different races and groups that goes on in like lord of the rings but there's there has to be something, you know, deeper than just kind of the 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 simple plot line that goes along. And like the I think the really good writers at last somehow have a, a bigger vision of the world that they bring together through their novels. And um Yeah, it's 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 it it intuitively rings true, even if it's like a fantasy world. Yeah, 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 exactly. You learn things about your own, right? And and people thought Tolkien was writing about the Second World War and so forth, but he wasn't really, but but it had so many aspects of these, you know, different groups and uh, coming together and, and good and evil and different power nexus. And, you know, it, it's a fascinating novel on that level um, or set of novels, I, I, I guess. Yeah. And actually, I, I, I do recall Dune not having as clear of like bright lines between good and evil. Is that true or is it yeah, yeah. clearly good versus evil? No, I think that that's part of it, too. Right. Because, you know, um, you're following this character who's suddenly becoming very, very powerful. And he realizes he can see forward and see the movements that are going to follow him and see that, that he can't control them and they're going to do things that are not necessarily good. Um, and and, and he, it, it's sort of faded in his case, right? He, it, it's, he's unable to stop it. And um, I think that that's kind of the, it, that's the tragedy in it, right? Which is really interesting. That, that I always think of great tragedy as something where you can see this thing happening 
and you're, you're sort of like saying, no, you don't want it to happen, but but it's inevitable and, and the characters are, are pulled in that direction and he is himself sees his fate and, and realizes he can't escape it. And, and you know, that, that's a very powerful narrative. Yeah. So there's kind of like a, a like great waves of history that we're just riding. And yeah, exactly. We're, we're sort of on there. Yeah. yeah. And you might as well enjoy the ride. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so maybe so, some aspects of like that, that portion of Marxism where it's like, all right, we're just riding the, riding this wave of history. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I'll, uh, uh, I, I did actually find Dune at my parents' house recently, so I may have to, uh, reread it. Yeah. 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 And, and endorsed for its, uh, uh, somewhat interesting take on, network science as well. So <laughs> exactly. <care>. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so to circle back to some of these ideas about, um, spreading microfinance within these Indian villages, right. To go from, uh, um, harvesting spice to, uh, yeah. I don't know what, what, what crops are these folks growing? Oh, uh, well, the, actually, you know, some of the villages, this is Southern India. Some of it is, um, silkworms, um, millet, um, you know, some rice, so there, there are some staple crops. There's different tubers that they eat, and uh, and you know, sericulture is actually a big one in there, which means silkworm production. So they can actually produce silk and then sell some of the silk. But it's you know very um, labor intensive uh, work, and you know the the it's not terribly um, productive land that they live in. This is it's. Uh, yeah, not highly productive soil and and um weather so uh it's a, it's a rough tough living. work yes yeah <laughs> not an easy not an easy place to live yeah so so just the idea then of of some of these folks taking advantage of these microfinance loans potentially smoothing out some of the variability in their income you know getting themselves out of these months of extreme poverty um seems like it's potentially good right it's like okay mm-hmm. this seems like there's some positive impacts here. Um, but then you also discovered in some other work that there may actually be some, some negative consequences to the social network, right. Of these villages. And, you know, I mean, this is sort of like a, um, standard critique of like capitalism as well. Like, oh, capitalism comes in and like destroys communities. And in this case, it's like, oh yeah, maybe it actually kind of does in this case. So, (laughs) so what, what did you actually find there? Yeah. So this was, you know, this was, uh, serendipitous. It was a little bit by, by chance. So what happened was we entered these villages and we're working with this microfinance organization in 2006, 2007, and they had planned to enter 75 villages. So we went into all 75 villages and mapped out all the social structure and, and what was going on in these villages. And then they started entering and they managed to only enter 43 of them before the financial crisis hit. And the financial crisis then led the bank to stop the lending program. And so they were like midway and rolling this thing out. And then suddenly they said, oh, we can't. Um, so we got, th- they entered 43 of these villages and then not the other 32. And so then we thought, well, wow, now we can see what the impact of the microfinance is on the villages. Maybe this will like, you know, um, improve the village social structure or change it in some interesting ways. So then after um, a couple of years, we went back in in basically 2000. 10, 11, 12, and we resurveyed all these villages. So we mapped out the networks again afterwards. And then we could look before and after. So we could see here's what happened in the microfinance villages. Here's what happened in the non microfinance villages, the, the villages that didn't get the microfinance. And basically, in all these villages, there was some deterioration in networks. And this is partly because they're in an area where, um, there's been urban growth in, in some areas, and so it's kind of pulling people out of the villages, and so the, the social networks are being disrupted generally. So all, across all the villages, you saw about a 15% drop in the, the connectivity of people in terms of borrowing and lending and socializing and getting advice from each other. But then in the microfinance villages, it was roughly double. So you, you saw about a 30% drop in the, in the density of their networks. So you saw a pretty dramatic increase and, you know, losing a third of your connections, that, that's, that's a, you know, like if you sort of said, uh, you're not going to be friends with a third of the people you're friends with now, um, that's a pretty big drop. Um, and, and so we saw that and, it, and it's, it's pretty robust. So we've, we've also then did some experiments in another area where we could control where we went in with microfinance and so forth. And, and we see very similar results 
and and that study. So microfinance, the availability of these loans seems to fundamentally rewire the way in which people are connecting to each other's. Um, and and you know as as you're pointing out, it's it's changing these networks and it's changing them in a way that's where people are losing their connections, um, their social connections. And, and, and are they losing those connections then because normally they would rely on each other to kind of like get through the hard times and they would say, oh, like, you know, we're waiting for the harvest and we need to sort of make it through these next few months. So like, let's pull our resources and that is no longer the incentive there. Is that what's going on or is it something else? Yeah, it's, it's actually, um, it's, it's a fairly nuanced and rich picture. And what, what basically happens is, okay, there's some subset of people in the village that end up getting um, loans. So say in a typical village, it might be a quarter of the population who, a uh, quarter of the households who would take up these loans. Um, these people now have this source of money that they don't need to borrow and lend from each other, from other friends. So you would expect their borrowing and lending networks to, to, to drop a bit, those people. Um, but interestingly, when you look at people who didn't get loans, so so take the the you know the rest, the three quarters of the, of the village that didn't get involved in the loan program, and look at relationships just between them, those disappear as well, and um, they're doing less borrowing and lending um, amongst each other, um, and and you see that their consumption gets noticeably worse in terms of its variance in in the places where um, these you know, the microfinance has entered and reached some of the population, the, popu the population that doesn't have that access is losing its network and losing some of its um, income smoothing and so forth. So we, we actually can measure that and see that. And, and that's, you know, a little bit disturbing because that's not the intention of providing these loans, right? Um, so there's all kinds of side effects. And, you know, there's complex stories behind why this is all happening. Um, and part of it is just, you know, as you, you're saying, these people don't, the people who got loans don't necessarily have need to, to borrow and lend. And part of what uh, it seems to be going on is, you know, a lot, there's a lot of socializing that happens in a village, say around the tea shops and around the village square, you go and you hang out with your friends and so forth. And now the people who got loans don't show up there anymore. And when they don't show up, then it's less exciting to go to the tea shop or just hang out in the square. And then that becomes less of a place. And now people are just socializing overall less. So you get this catalyst that the loans cause some people to drop out of that, and then that causes more people to drop out, and then the whole level of social activity in the village tends to drop. And, and that's sort of an, a very big unintended consequence of these things, right? Yeah, it kind of destroys the scene or whatever. Right? Yeah, it's like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah I'm yeah. just going to go downtown and hang out. It's right, like, oh, right, there's right. nowhere. And, and now there's it's no not people the, there. There's it, nowhere to go. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's sort of, yeah, and once that happens, and, you know, this is sort of, it, it, it's in line, I guess, a little bit with what Robert Putnam, you know, he, he was, has this book, Bowling Alone, where he talks about the d demise of bowling alleys. And these things were sort of the, you know, fundamental fabric of communities and so forth. And, and here we're seeing, you know, something that looks a lot like that, which is the, these loans come in and then, you know, the, the town square and the, the tea shops lose their activity and, and you know, people aren't um, hanging out as much anymore. And, and that ends up hurting the people who didn't get the loans a lot more than the people who did, because now they're, you know, they're without that ability to borrow and lend with each other. And, and it also hurts. It turns out that a lot of our networks are interlaced. So the same people I might be hanging out with at the square might be not only giving me, you know, loans when I need it, but might also be giving me advice and giving me information. And so I, I lose all those other networks as well. And, and that, you know, that's something that, that doesn't mean we should stop loan programs, but it means that we should be a little more careful as to what the, you know, how they might rewire um, a community. Sure. And if I, if I recall correctly, Putnam's thesis is that um, like a lot of the destruction of these local gathering places is related to kind of like both the transaction costs and the opportunity cost of socializing, where it's like, Oh, now I commute around. So rather than just sort of staying in my whatever village or whatever, it's like I go to work over here and maybe I am in some recreational activity over there, but I live in this spot. So it's not as easy for me to just kind of like hang out in an undirected way. And then also I have like cable TV at home. Yeah. And currently yeah, yeah, yeah. I have the internet. Right. So it's like 
I'm not sitting there bored looking for something to do. You know, I have a high transaction cost to go somewhere and I have the opportunity cost of like, oh, I could just watch TV, <laughs> yeah, yeah, which yeah. is a pretty enjoyable activity. And that that seems to be, at least according to Putnam, like one of the reasons that people stay home more. Is it, are there effects like that in these villages where people smooth out their income and then they, you know, maybe are commuting more or they have access to more electronics? Or is it just the fact that they they no longer have the incentive to just kind of like have a bunch of loose connections in case they need to get by for a few weeks? Yeah, I think I think it's a little bit of both. So part of it is that that um I mean this is conjecture too. We we don't actually know exactly why they they stopped showing up in the town square and so forth. But it it you know, one is that the the fact that they've got this, especially once they've done this for a couple of years, and then you know, so for instance, the example we talked about before, where you know three of the women get together and they get a loan, and then they get a truck from their brother. Now they actually are, are running a small business, and that small business takes time and takes them away from you know sort of hanging out where they would normally. Now they're doing that, and and so they're busier. They don't have as much time. They don't have the same needs. Um, so, so, and they're hanging out more together. So the one thing you do see is the people who are put in these groups of five together, they form stronger friendships. So you're, you're much more likely to have friendships among these women that are putting groups of five together who are then held jointly responsible. That kind of helps them form this new clique. And, and then they're not associating with the rest of the village. And so the rest of the village is, is seeing less interaction. Um, they're interacting more amongst themselves. And that it's both that um, less need to go through the rest of the village and more opportunity cost of their time that, you know, taking them away from whatever they're doing with the, the business and the other things that they've been able to get from the loans. Yeah, that that's, that's really interesting because the folks who are getting these loans are already like a different type of family or group yeah. for any number of reasons. So you're kind of pulling out these yeah. social anchors or whatever, yeah, which yeah. is so like, like you mentioned, uh, worse and like more negative for the folks who aren't quite as plugged in in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's been an amazing um, change in the, like the, the book, the human network I talk about um, one massive change that's been going on in China in the past few decades has been this migration from rural areas to the urban areas. And, and that sort of takes away the young, younger people who are, are the most productive, who are, are, are moving to try and find a job and so forth. And, and that's sort of torn apart the social structure that they used to have. And, you know, a lot of families are built on relying on the children to then support the parents when the parents become old and so forth. And now instead of having the child around and taking care of them, you know, occasionally they might get money from the city and so forth. But there's a lot of families that, that basically just break apart. And, and that time period, you know, it's not as if you want to say, look, we want to stop progress. Um, or technological change or economic advances from from hitting our economies, but we do have to realize that the that during these times of transition, there can be a lot of disruption that can be incredibly painful for the people who are relying on others that are suddenly pulled away from them from these kinds of of um, events, and and that's something that you know I think we're constantly experiencing, but. It sometimes can can hit a, almost a critical level, um, especially in these rural areas that are are very poor uh, and susceptible. Yeah, and the and the folks who are getting hit the hardest are already the people who potentially have the the least to lose in the first place. So it's kind of like doubly bad for them. Um, qu question on the just this, I guess this transition that that starts to occur then for some of these folks. I mean, if, you know, most of the listeners to this podcast are going to be Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic, <laughs> right, right? So that they're, yeah, the weird, uh... they're sort of like, yeah, like I'm used yeah, yeah. to, you know, stuff generally working. If I want to do something, I can like go on a website and submit a form and, you know, I can like move money around and generally I wait in line and stuff happens. And like, I kind of live in my own little house and go out and do stuff, right? That we don't necessarily think about those things, um, but that that's not the norm in a lot of the world. Um, and so there, there's a lot of positives to these kind of like weird, uh, you know, social structures. But as we mentioned, there's some negatives too. But I guess I'm curious, you know, the, 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 the negative outcomes, the negative externalities on these folks who are um, hurt by these, you know, networks dissolving, do, do we simultaneously see like, 
less corruption, um, like more tolerance of, you know, people having like different religious beliefs or sexual identities? Do we see like less uh, like hatred of outgroups, right? These, these sort of like clannish yeah, yeah. behaviors that we don't necessarily think of um, as being, you know, like, like part of a, um, like a more weird psychology, if that makes sense. Right, right. Um, you know, I, I think that the, that kind of development question um, will take a long time to answer because we don't have really good data on how societies grow and change at, 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 at that level. So you're talking about whole cultural changes that, that can come along with this. So we bring in this economic change, then we get this social disruption, and maybe that social disruption means that now the caste system isn't as strong as it used to be, or it could lead to other kinds of changes. And maybe you know these technological advances can allow people to connect in different ways that can overcome some of the, the barriers that have been put in by traditional structures. And, you know, I guess it's, yeah, it, it is true that these traditional structures are very strong supporters. And, you know, I think that um, when you start thinking about things like social capital, um, it, it might be useful to sort of break these into two pieces. There's the kind of social capital that's very valuable for providing information, for providing out opportunities and so forth. And those are kind of, you know, how well am I connected into things like getting loans and and getting technology and getting access to, to things that are good and useful. And that can be enhanced by a lot of the technology. And then there's all these other kinds of things, which is um, I need support, I need help. Um, you know, like in a, in a small village, like if, if you break an arm or a leg and you're not productive for a while, that's, it, you know, in, in a modern society, if you, it, it, you break an arm or a leg, that's not a big deal for, for somebody. It's, it, it's not as if they're gonna, um, not be able to work the fields and, and their family's going to starve. And these things can be catastrophic events for, for somebody in this kind of situation. And then these, these tight knit networks are much more uh, important and, and effective. And so they can help people through these really, really hard times. And, you know, part of it is we don't necessarily want to, um, we, we want to make sure that the people still have those support groups and the, that kind of structure and safety net that isn't necessarily being provided until the society is able to provide that. And even in, in the weird societies that we live in, right, these um, Western industrialized, really, you know, et, et cetera, um, we still have people who don't have those safety nets, right, and, and, and still rely a lot on each other for, for basic help and like taking care of their kids or, or doing something when they got an emergency or, you know, they, they can't get a loan if, if they're personally bankrupt or, you know, maxed out on their credit cards and stuff. So, it still matters to the poorest people. These kinds of social structures can be the most important and vital for them. Yeah, I think that's a really important distinction between the the networks of opportunity and and the networks of help. And yeah, I don't I don't think I've ever thought of it that way, but that makes so much sense. Where it's like, oh, okay, yeah, that that both of those are very important, and both of those can be like life changing and crucial. And that potentially, you know, creating more networks of opportunity actually might destroy networks of help. And it's yeah. like, oh, okay, yeah, how do you yeah. balance that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And 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 you know, in at these at this level, people need both of them, right? And and we we want to make sure we're providing the opportunities and the information and everything, but at the same time, not destroying the the help that they need. Um yeah. So so to to zoom out again then from like, okay, we have these these concepts of networks that are at least partially illuminated in these specific microfinance situations, right? I mean, now we're kind of talking about bigger picture policy ideas of like, okay, how do you potentially get folks who who need it um, more opportunity without destroying their their access to help, right? How do you get um, people who, you know, like you mentioned, maybe they would have benefited from microfinance, but they're in some cluster that no one else actually spoke to. Um, you know, I know, I know that like this kind of academic research and then just being like, and here's what we should do, right? That that's like a kind of like a big, a big jump yeah. to take and, yeah. and potentially has some unintended consequences as, you, as you've discovered. But I guess I'm just curious, like, what are your thoughts on, on actually like trying to implement something to solve some of those problems without creating more problems? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm into, I, mean, I have this idea that I, I like to call policy um, cocktails. And, and the idea is basically that in a lot of situations, especially as academics, we sort of look at a particular problem and say, oh, oh, here's the solution, right? And the solution is a particular prescription of, okay, we need more loans or we need, and, and once you start looking at the impact of these things, if we just measured 
oh, what's the impact of the actual loan itself? We would have missed this whole social impact. And, and more generally, I think we need to take a more holistic viewpoint where one policy in isolation isn't necessarily going to have the intended consequences and isn't necessarily going to be as good as if we had put several policies in together, right? And so it might be that at the same time we put in this loan program, we also want to put in some kind of social program that helps um, you know, groups connect or you know, do something social within the community to, to try and keep people, um, it, it provide opportunities for them to reach out to somebody if they have a crisis or you know, um, you know, figure out some other way of, of providing that safety net that's missing. But that that policy could be much more effective than just putting one, you know, one actually could be a net negative if we just put it one at a time. Whereas if we think about what's the trajectory of the society, what do we want to be happening? How can we help it overcome the issues it's going to have in the short run? Um, we could provide a, a much more effective and, and better policy and one that might not make people, you know, less, it might be that they sort of even think badly of the microfinance. It's like life was better before we had microfinance, right? Or something like that. And, and you know, overcome that kind of negative reaction and the negative impacts of those things. Um, yeah. So, so it's a matter of, you know, analyzing the, the outcomes in these kind of natural experiments, finding the unintended consequences, and then potentially figuring out, okay, is there another policy that we can introduce that will um, do something to alleviate that, that negative unintended yeah, yeah, consequence? Yeah. But it, I think more generally too, when you think about you know policy construction and so forth, um, it's pretty rare that that there's only one thing that's broken or one thing that needs to be fixed. And a lot of these things have this kind of weakest link sort of structure to them. So if you think about um, you know uh, say giving out student loans, so we want to encourage people to be able to take advantage of education. We know that financially they have difficulties, so we're going to give out student loans. Okay, well that's great, and 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 enables some people to you know to take out those loans and so forth. But then if we don't give them good opportunities for jobs afterwards, then they're unable to pay back those loans, and the, the loan program is a lot worse, and they don't want to take it up as much because they don't have those opportunities. And so instead, if you coupled it together with like a student loan program and some kind of work um, accessibility, not just a forgiveness program afterwards, but something where you you try and connect those people with jobs then it can be more, much more effective. Or if we think, well, now can we prepare more of the, the people to be able to take up those student loans to begin with? And, and thinking of these holistic you know, cocktail ideas where you've, you're putting together three or four different pieces of a policy to all attack a common problem, but from different angles, you can get synergies and complementarities there that are, make these things much more effective than any single one of them would be alone, right? Yeah, that's interesting. I um from like a I guess an empirical perspective, you know, the the concern with a lot of policies is this kind of idea of like unintended consequences, right? Like, oh, okay, that sounds like a good idea. You know, your your moral intuitions are in the right spot, but then you implement this thing and like people game it or it destroys local social networks or whatever. Um do, does it seem from an empirical perspective that implementing like multiple things actually does reduce these negative externalities or is it something where it's like oh wow you just like created you know imagine someone I, I remember my grandpa being on like 10 different drugs and it was just like this constant problem of like oh well, he's on this blood pressure medica medication so you, you shouldn't have given him that but like no one's really doing a good job of keeping track of it and he was just like constantly right, right. disoriented until someone finally figured out the right you know cocktail of medications yeah yeah exactly and, and i think you know, um, we have further study. We've been doing a large scale project um, on immunization, trying to get people to take up um, shots. This was actually pre COVID that we were doing this in, in Haryana, another part of India. And there we were trying, we tried 75 different policy combinations. So, massive mm. project with all kinds of different uh, inter interplay between policies. And um, we found some very effective combinations where the combinations were much different. You know, they had a much different impact than any of the than we would have expected from the individual policies separately. So, but it, you know, there wasn't an easy answer. We couldn't have predicted. It, it it wasn't as if our predictions were right. You know, so we we could have we had guesses as to what would work, but the specific combination of okay, you actually have to give people a little bit of a financial nudge 
together with the right information flow, together with um, the right kind of reminder system. And, you know, like, so we needed like four things to go together. And then once you got all four things, then suddenly, boom, a lot of people participated. You get participation up by almost 50%. You know, so you get a, a big bang when you put these things together, but you take one of them away and then it, it all fell apart, right? And so it's sort of like building a chair without four legs, right? And in a lot of policies we build with one leg, it doesn't make for a very good chair, right? It's sort of, um, <laughs> and, and you're not sure what, you know, it, if you've ever built a chair before, you don't, you're not sure how to do it, right? So um, <laughs> You're like, something keeps going wrong. Here. <laughs> yeah, like, like, I think I'm on the right track, but yeah. clearly we're missing something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were, were, the, um, were the effective combinations, were those then that was that policy cocktail was that transferable or did it have like very local effects where it's like oh well yeah we you know put the signs in this spot in this village but that only worked because like that's where people hung out here you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah exactly so so i think you know that's something that we'll be learning over time is once we're aware that that policies work better in combinations and in very specific kinds of combinations it, it'll take us a while to learn why is it that there's a synergy between these two things? You know, what's really going on? And, and maybe it's that people need to be reminded and they need to have it um, seem relevant to them and they have to see something in the future. And you, know, like you need these three things, but we have to figure out what are those things that seem to be driving this. And the more we experiment with this a little bit, maybe we'll, we'll begin to understand those relationships and be able to say, yeah, you, you, need, you, know, you need four legs or at least three legs on a chair. Um, two or one leg isn't going to work, and and then we'll have an understanding of why it, you know what the structure, what the engineering structure is behind it. Sure, it's 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 almost like um, designing like a, a nozzle for turbulent flow, where it's like, okay, we have some idea of what's going to happen here, and we can maybe make ten potential designs based upon our theoretical framework. But really, we just have to try these ten, and we just pick the best one, and then maybe A B it with another one until yeah, we come yeah, up with yeah, something yeah, that works. Yeah. And then that, that, and that actually seeing what works then helps you go back and figure out why it worked and mm. figure out a little bit more about how the airflow is going. And then you can, you know, iterate back and forth. Um, but I think it's going it, to, it'll take us a while to, to really get this right. But I think a lot more, uh, you know, in, in so many arenas where we think about, you know, a lot of the attention is spent on one policy at a time. You know, like we want universal basic income or we want, um, you know, to change this kind of tax rate, or we want infrastructure, or we want, but not thinking about, oh, you know, actually combinations of these things could be much more effective than any one alone, and we should be balancing them carefully. Uh, I think that's important. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of the issues come from the, the access to opportunity, and that that's like a harder thing to craft a policy specifically for. You have to kind of like design yeah. around it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And, and things that get social in this way are much harder kinds of policies than ones that are just, you know, moving money around or. Um, and so once you get into arenas where people are, re, are changing their social structure and losing support and these kinds of things um, and cultures might be changing, you know, we're we're into uncharted territories in terms of our understanding. Totally. So a lot of the stuff we talked about is in some papers, which we'll link to in the show notes. A lot of these concepts are also in your book, uh, which is fantastic, right? I mean, there's like so many notes that I took on the book that I took on the papers. And, you know, before we started recording, I was like, I have 10 hours worth of things that we could talk about. So yeah, I mean, the, the book is great. Um, we'll link to these papers. You have some courses on Coursera. Where, where should people go if they want to, you know, by the human network, which is the book, if they want to keep up with you, what's the what's the best way for them to do that? Um, well, you can just if you Google me, Matthew O. Jackson, they can find me on uh, my web page, and I you know will be posting things. And actually, I'm trying to build a new Coursera course now, um, sort of more accessible, general public version of a networks class. So uh, that'll be coming out hopefully soon. And um, yeah. Um, it's always, there's more things, you know, just as you say, I've got so many things I want to do and <laughs> it's always a matter of trying to prioritize. So. Totally. Cool. Yeah. And we'll, we'll link to your, to your webpage as well, which yeah, has links to some of the Coursera courses, other interviews you've done. You can find the book, all that stuff. Yeah. It's been great talking to you, Todd.